now we can confirm that we can start this new um, webinar. Um, thank you very much for your participation and welcome to another session of our TIA for Global Network uh, webinar series, which aim to provide updated news on Tropical Race 4. My name is Victor Prada and I am the secretary of the Volvana Forum. The Volvana Forum is a multi-stakeholder permanent platform of assembly to address the main challenges of the banana industry. The platform or the forum is hosted in FAO headquarters, accurately in the Trade and Markets Division. I would like to stop here by acknowledging the support provided by the TR4 Global Network active members, uh, their contributions and feedback to materialize this interesting webinar agenda, etc. Today, as mentioned before, we have a total of 1,234 registered participants. And uh, well, this ongoing series of dialogue um, on a topic that is urgent, complex, and multidimensional is also an opportunity to strengthen the relations of different stakeholders with different methodologies and varieties for the benefit of millions of rural families who depend on banana production to survive. So today, the reason we are here is to talk about the tr 4 resistant varieties. Very quick, I would like to give you some information about the meeting itself, uh, some housekeeping rules is please uh, try to keep your microphone always muted, as this is for panelists, if you are not speaking. If you'd like to intervene, uh, we'd like to kindly ask you to raise your hand or write, or write in the chat box, and I will give you the floor as soon as possible. As is customary, the webinar will be recorded and will be published in the FAO uh, TR4 Global Network website and the FAO YouTube channel. Then important information for the interpretation is that, as mentioned before, interpretation is available in Spanish and English and can be selected in the bar at the bottom of the website. Um, and if your sound quality is not uh, is poor, is not sufficient, then it will it, that complicates the, the work done by the interpreters. And then um, it will be better if you don't use built-in uh, microphones in the computer. Instead, it's better to use a USB headset. And then, um, yeah, if you have several people talking in the same microphone, uh, we really appreciate if you can speak close to the microphone. And then um, last suggestion would be to uh, switch on your camera, uh, use your camera um, when you're speaking and lower your mask if that's the case, if, well, if distancing allows you to do it. So that's it on my end. I would like now to give the floor to Pascal Liu, Senior Economist in the Trade and Markets Division and Team Leader of the Responsible Global Value Chain Team. Pascal, you have the screen. Thank you. Thank you, Victor. Can you hear me well? So unclear, yes. Perfect. OK. So ladies and gentlemen, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening. Buenos dias, buenas tardes. Welcome to this webinar on the TR4 resistant banana varieties organized by the World Banana Forum and FAO's sub-regional office for Central America. As Victor mentioned, the WBF is a, the World Banana Forum is a multi-stakeholder platform. It includes all stakeholder groups involved in the banana sector globally, from producer organizations, exporters, importers, retailers, governments of exporting and importing countries, research institutions, development agencies, unions of workers on banana farms, consumer associations, environmental and human rights associations, and other civil society organizations. The World Banana Forum operates through three working groups, each of them focusing on one dimension of the sustainability environmental, social, and economic sustainability. And it also operates through task forces, specialized task forces. TR4 is a great concern for the World Banana Forum. Uh, the disease, as many people know, has been spreading over decades from Asia and the Pacific to other regions, going westward, reaching Southeast Asia, South Asia, the Middle East, uh, East Africa, 
And uh, more recently, it also reached the Americas. And it was reported for the first time officially in the Americas in 2019 in Colombia. And then uh, last April, it was reported in Peru. So it is moving and spreading over the world. And this is creating a lot of concerns among banana producers and exporters. So as a reaction to the spread of uh, TR4, the steering committee of the World Banana Forum decided in 2013 to create a task force on TR4. On TR4. Um, the task force gathers experts from research institutes, national plant protection organizations, companies, producer organizations, development agencies, and uh, also some non-governmental organizations. So the task force has been operating since 2013, 2014. And in 2020, two years ago, the World Banana Forum and FAO launched jointly the global network on TR4, which plays the role of a global hub for dissemination of knowledge, information, and good practices on TR4, also for early warning of producers, and also for the dissemination of training materials and extension materials. It also plays the role of coordination of global efforts to combat the disease. The global network on TR4 has hundreds of participants and it reaches out to over 2,500 people involved in the banana sector globally. It can count on the experts from FAO's Plant Protection Division and the WF Secretariat and also those of the task force on TR4, plus other partners and external collaborators. Now, there's a lot of concern about TR4, as I mentioned before, because once it has reached the plantation and it's in the soil, TR4 is almost impossible to eliminate, and it can stay there in the soil for decades. So there's no, actually very reliable, there's no reliable management method known to try you know, to uh, suppress the disease what's in stored in, in the soil. Also more to that, spores spread very easily. They can be spread by wind, they can be spread by you know, water courses, flooding, the movement of animals and people and equipment. So that is really creating uh, a problem and a great threat to producers. So managing, you know, protecting a plantation or a farm against TR4 requires heavy and costly biosafety measures, you know, very, a, a strong organization and very strict protocols that have, been, that have to be complied with. So this is costly for large plantations and farms, but it is also a particular challenge for small growers who do not necessarily have the capacity and organization and resources to put up all the biosafety measures that are necessary. So it makes it even more challenging for them. So in light of this, developing varieties of bananas that are resistant to TR4, or at least tolerant of it, and this can be discussed, looks like the most sustainable approach to addressing the challenge of TR4. So today we will hear about promising work in the area of developing resistant varieties, and Victor will introduce the agenda for day one of this webinar. Thank you for your attention. Victor, the floor is back to you. Thank you very much, Pascal, for the comprehensive introduction. Uh, now I'd like to give the screen, um, the floor to Raisa Jauger, Agricultural Officer and Focal Point for Activities on TIA4 in the Subregional Office in Panama. Thank you, Raisa. Muchas gracias, Víctor. Muy buenos días, buenas tardes, buenas noches también, según el lugar en que nos encontremos. Tengan todos los presentes y las instituciones participantes en esta sesión de webinario sobre variedades de bananos resistentes a la raza 4 tropical, desde la selección hasta la demanda del mercado. Organizado por el Foro Mundial Bananero y la Oficina de la FAO para Mesoamérica el cual, como han explicado, tiene como objetivo proporcionar una descripción general de las variedades de bananos tolerantes o resistentes a R4T, una actualización sobre esos temas, 
y los desafíos hoy relacionados con todo lo que es la introducción y aceptación en el mercado. Para nuestra región de América Latina y el Caribe, los países están sumergidos en la recuperación de nuestros sistemas agroalimentarios golpeados por la pandemia de la COVID. Y en esta compleja situación, la raza 4 tropical de la Marchitez Porfusarium de las Musáceas es el reto más desafiante que enfrenta la agroindustria de banano y plátano en nuestra región. Sin embargo, en este contexto se convierte en una oportunidad para incentivar el desarrollo e introducción de innovaciones que refuercen la bioseguridad a diferentes niveles, las mejores prácticas de manejo de los cultivos y el suelo y las alternativas para la recuperación de los países afectados. También lo es para nosotros a nivel de América Latina y, y Caribe, gran importancia abordar integralmente el fortalecimiento de la institucionalidad encargada de la gestión de plagas, la responsabilidad también del sector eh, público y la corresponsabilidad y todas las acciones que se vienen realizando en alianza con el sector privado, la colaboración y el involucramiento en general de la sociedad en su conjunto. Cientos de miles de familias dependen de la agroindustria del banano y del plátano como medio de vida y parte importante de su seguridad alimentaria. También estos cultivos son relevantes para las economías de muchos países a nivel global. La raza 4 tropical de la Marchitez porfusarium es una de las plagas más devastadoras de las musáceas. Y en nuestro América Latina y Caribe, desde su registro en Colombia a mediados del 19 y con posterioridad en Perú en el 2021, las probabilidades de introducción en otros países de la región se han incrementado. Por tanto, la FAO a nivel de nuestra región y a nivel global trabaja con los gobiernos y sus ONPF para construir capacidad de prevención, preparación, respuesta y recuperación y apoya especialmente a pequeños productores y genera de manera articulada soluciones para los sistemas agroalimentarios sean más resilientes, inclusivos, eficientes y sostenibles. Un aspecto central para superar un brote y una posible epidemia de FOC R4T es que el sector privado puede acceder de manera biosegura a nuevas variedades alternativas a Cavendish, producto de mejoramiento genético. De manera conjunta, FAO también trabaja con los gobiernos y las ONPF para que se compartan experiencias exitosas con materiales indexados cuyo origen son países y sitios que dan garantía de trazabilidad, que garantizan importaciones de germoplasma y de material dedicado a la producción comercial. En estos dos días del webinario estaremos compartiendo con expertos internacionales que representan instituciones de diferentes latitudes del mundo, quienes informarán sobre el mejoramiento genético de las musáceas, agendas de investigación y las opciones actuales de materiales de Cavendish promisorios para su resistencia a FOC R4T. FAO refuerza su compromiso de continuar apoyando a los gobiernos y contribuir a la sostenibilidad agrícola y a la resiliencia del sector y los medios de subsistencia. Adicionalmente, la FAO intenta reforzar la cooperación con el sector privado, los centros de investigación, las universidades de manera articulada para asegurar una agenda científica de innovación y transferencia tecnológica para encontrar soluciones a los grandes desafíos que impone la presencia de R4T en un medio de una muy cambiante oferta climática, así como que corresponda a las necesidades de todos los actores de las cadenas de las musáceas. Seguro que será un espacio de intercambio que nos permita avanzar en las estrategias de manejo para la raza 4 tropical y otras enfermedades importantes del banano de manera eficiente para poder lograr los Objetivos de Desarrollo Sostenible. Muchas gracias y agradezco en particular al Foro Mundial Bananero por esta iniciativa y de trabajo de manera articulada con nuestra región de América Latina y Caribe. Cambio, Víctor. Muchas gracias, Raíz, Raíza. 
Thank you very much for your uh, remarks before we start. And now I think that for the sake of time, it would be good if we can go really quick through the agenda. We decided to divide the webinars today in three sections. Uh, the first one on international cooperation and breeding. Uh, that will be um, provided by Dr. Herr Kema from Wageningen University and Anker Sorensen Sor Sor from Cajun. Um, then we will have another block on Formosana experience uh, provided by Dr. Agustin Molina and Dr. Altus Viljo and Dr. Molina representing the uh, Ministry of Agriculture in the Philippines and, and Altus uh, Viljo and the Stellenbosch University. And the third uh, component, the third uh, block will be provided by Dr. Adolfo Martinez um, from the Honduran uh, Foundation of Agricultural Research um, and also by Frederick Barcri uh, representing CIRA, the French Agricultural Research Center for International Development. So um, I would like to remember you before we continue with the agenda that um, we have another day tomorrow. We will continue with, with the activities and the and, and more panelists, of course, to complete the information and, and provide us as much uh, knowledge and as much information as possible to, to the big audience we have. We have more than 500 participants now. And then um, we will cover tomorrow aspects such as conventional breeding and resistant varieties and cover other topics such as uh, gene editing, uh, tier 4 resistance in, in cavities and obstacles and opportunities for successful banana varieties and on diversification, etc. And that will be with the participation of different organizations and experiences worldwide. This webinar is the first one of a series of webinars um, on varieties. This is very important for you to know that we didn't have the capacity to um, ask or gather all the different entities and specialists or scientists working on TIA4, on different varieties. So um, it will be really appreciated if you could kindly after these webinars, because we will have more uh, webinars following this one um, with more panelists. So if you have any suggestion, uh, you know all the plant pathologies, uh, or plant pathologies, sorry, um, with good results, um, it would be good if you could let us know. We are confident you will find this webinar uh, really interesting. And that being said, um, I would like now to continue with the agenda on uh, international cooperation on breeding. And for that, I would like to give the floor to uh, Dr. Herkema. Um, um, Dr. Herkema is an expert on, on fungal plant diseases such as Fusarium wheel, Tropical Race 4, that he researched for over 10 years now. He is currently the head of uh, the laboratory of phytopathology at Wageningen University and coordinates major banana research programs on Fusarium um, or banana, among other topics, of course. Professor Kema also coordinated a public-private partnership devoted to technical solutions for banana growers, co-funded several startup companies and has over 120 scientific papers published. So. Um, Dr. Kema, Professor Kema, please, the screen is yours. Thank you, Victor, and thank you very much for the invitation to be part of uh, today's meeting. Um, well, good day to everybody. I realize that for some of the participants, it's already Thursday. Um, here it's still Wednesday. Um, yeah, so I was uh, asked by the World Banana Forum, the FAO, actually to uh, provide you with some information on international uh, collaborative projects. So I do this actually on behalf of the project that you see here on the first slide, which is coordinated by IETA and uh, Ronnie Spenner. So Ronnie shared a couple of slides with me, which helps me to introduce this program to you. Um, and then later on during the presentation, uh, Anker Sørensen, my colleague at Kijin, will take over because he will uh talk about the company that we uh started a breeding company in the netherlands uh, for bananas which is called yellowway so anchor will take the floor then so i i only have a, a couple of slides so as i said the project that is currently ongoing funded by the gates foundation and some of the participants in this meeting are also collaborating in this project 
uh, is coordinated with ITA, in particular Ronnie Fennan at the University of uh, the Catholic University of Leuven. It's called Accelerated Breeding of Better Bananas. Uh, as you see here in the title, the improvement of banana for smallholder farmers in the Great Lake region of Africa. So we can go to the next slide, um, please. And just click on until we have everything. Um, yeah, thank you very much. So um, th this entire program really revolves around breeding highland bananas, which is a, a major staple food in East Africa. Um, and so the, the 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 average consumption of of banana in that region is about 350k per person per year but these are cooking bananas you see the examples here on the left hand of the uh, the left side of the uh, of the slide and in particular i would like to draw your attention to this table in the lower left corner where you see uh, matoka which is one of the major staple foods with the current yields per hectare uh, per year and a potential that we can obtain by breeding. And so uh, classical breeding in banana is extremely important to guarantee, of course, yield, but also quality. And in, in the framework of the meeting today, of course, we focus on disease resistance, but the advantage of, of classical breeding driven by the, uh, the best techno technological tools if, is of course that we can simultaneously look at those characteristics that we would like to improve. And that is, of course, not only resistance to fusarian wilt, but for sure also to a fungal disease like Black Cicatoka, for instance, which is a major threat all around the world. And so uh, this is the core, the core crop in the program. And in the next slide, you see the consortium uh, that is involved in this program. So the next slide, please. Yeah. Here we go. So, um, no and it, and Siri, my Siri is responding, <laughs> is responding to my voice. <laughs> so the, um, let me just click this on. Yeah, so here you see the partners involved in this, uh, in this uh, large consortium. So uh, major partners in Africa, as you can see, and actually, uh, the program that we are currently running is a continuation of the previous program. So uh, Kijin and Wageningen University only joined now in the second phase. So all the other partners that you see here on the screen uh, have already worked together for uh, four years in a program, and we just entered recently. Uh, so I, I'm happy to introduce the program, but some of the other, of the other partners really know more about the ongoing uh, activities. So, uh, but let me just finish to highlight what is our role here in this program. So that's on the next slide, please. Yeah, so here you see the overall and our role is really in the pre-breeding uh, part of the entire program. So as you can see, it's way broader. It is ongoing breeding program in East Africa, seed delivery systems, data management, communication and capacity building, but we are in the pre-breeding section of the program. And there is more details in the next slide. Yeah, so our role at Wageningen University is really revolving around effective-based screening. And we all are aware if you uh, start a breeding program for disease resistance, uh, the phenotyping of your material is absolutely crucial. Well, uh, phenotyping for resistance to fusarium wilt is complicated. We have multiple uh, genotypes of the, of the fungus. We have TR4, we have RACE1, we have RACE2. So if you can translate or trans, uh, transform that physical screening by effector-based screening, that is really incredibly increasing the throughput. And of course, eventually that has to come down to mapping genes. So once we have mapped genes, have the markers, we can really avoid phenotyping for a a great deal. So on the right hand side, you see the uh, students involved in the program at Wageningen University. So two PhDs and one postdoc. And so we focus primarily on the fungal side of the program. And then in the next slide, you see the key gene partners. And there are also four colleagues and they focus mostly on the host side. So uh, we received, seg received segregating population from IETA, phenotyped them uh, in Wageningen, share the data uh, with Keygene, who is responsible for the mapping and marker identification. And so that's it in a nutshell, what our role is in this international program. And with that, 
I think in the next slide, I would like to hand over now to my colleague, Anker Sørensen. So Anker, please go ahead. Yes, maybe I can introduce him because I didn't do it at the beginning. Thank you very much, Dr. Kema. And then uh, Anker Sørensen will continue now. He has more than 25 years of experience in plant breeding, holds a master's degree on plant breeding and phytopathology, and is currently the vice president of a new business, of new business section in Cajun. A uh, company, as mentioned, that focuses on, on developing and applying DNA expertise in the field of molecular genetics with a focus on crop plants. So um, both, again, Dr. Kema and Sorensen will, as, as you can see, will present us the efforts of Wageningen and Cajun international cooperation projects involving different institutions with the aim of improving uh, disease resistance in bananas. So Dr. Um, oh, Masters, uh, Mr. Sorensen, the screen is yours. Thank you. Hey, thank you very much, Victor, and also Gert for introducing. So indeed, uh, my, I have been busy in uh, crop improvement my entire career. That is uh, definitely my passion. But our knowledge uh, about banana is very recent. So it's only from the last uh, four or five years that we have also entered into the improvement of the banana crop. And to, do, to facilitate that, we started indeed a company in Wageningen which is called Yellowway, which has an entire focus of developing novel varieties uh, for the export market of bananas. But the knowledge that we develop uh, as uh, exemplified uh, in uh, what uh, Gert Kemer just showed is also very useful for many other types of bananas. For instance, you know, where are the resistant genes? How do they work? And how can we effectively cross them into elite material of many different uh, banana types? I'll tell you a little bit about what we do in Yellow Way in a quite fast way. Uh, to introduce uh, the approach that we are taking and is well on the way now. Next slide, please. So uh, a general statement that we have is that, uh, we, is that I think we most uh, uh, of us agree that there is a big need to uh, inducing genetic diversity in the banana market, simply because the continuation of the growth of the clone across the world with very little diversity is not sustainable exemplified by the big diseases that we now have. Next slide, please. In uh, Yellow Way, we have decided to focus on, on two major threats to the Cavendish banana as it is today. The first one is uh, Black Sika Toka, which is an, a very important component of the current uh, um, production of bananas. And we want to develop uh, varieties that uh, simply do not need spraying anymore and are resistant to this fungus, which attacks the leaves. And the next one, the topic of uh, today, next slide please, of course, is the Fusarium disease. Fusarium, a very well-known disease in many, many crops. We have been actually working on Fusarium for many years at uh, Kijin, but uh, so that knowledge can also be utilized when we try to attack this fungus in the banana crop. You all know uh, the development, so I won't talk too much about this, but uh, as we all know, it's a very serious threat. By the way, we also uh, participated in uh, identifying the fungus when it first entered uh, Colombia in 2019 with the technologies that we have developed to identify uh, these uh, different strains of, uh, of Fusarium. Next slide, please. If you look at uh, the consortium that we now have in place to attack this, consists of uh, three partners, Kijin, which I'm representing, uh, Shikita company and the company Musaradex, which is also a Wageningen based uh, company, which is all about innovation in uh, banana as a whole. But this particular consortium, Yellow Way, this particular consortium is completely focused on genetic improvement of uh, banana. Next slide, please. So the approach we are taking is uh, what we call uh, knowledge based breeding. And it has to do with the fact that we can utilize the technologies that are developed in many other crops in terms of uh, sequencing, comparative genomics, annotation of genomes. We are trying to utilize those tools for the breeding of banana. And in principle, uh, it, uh, our strategy is to go back to the, the gene pool that is available in gene banks, which contains a large uh, amount of diversity, as we know, but which is not utilized in commercial variety development. 
But if we can figure out which part of the genomes of these uh, exotic and wild germplasm are responsible for resistances to diseases, and if we can design crossing schemes and selection schemes that can bring these together in new varieties, then we believe that, uh, that we will be able to develop a whole range of novel varieties for the banana industry that are very uh, attractive for consumers and for producers, but at the same time carry the necessary resistances that are available in the gene pool. In this picture on the left, you see that we have uh, resequenced uh, a great amount of germplasm. And so we know the genetic makeup of these bananas. And we have also been able to identify resistance against TR4 in many of these accessions. And that is how we want to utilize this knowledge to breed novel varieties for the future. Next slide, please. Uh, there is one thing is to get the novel uh, resistances into elite varieties, but the other is to how do you make elite variety? Why has Cavendine been so successful? And why are other cultivated bananas so successful? For that, we compare the genomes between the different accessions and we try to figure out which regions of these are really necessary in order to get a banana that would be suitable not only for producers uh, and consumers uh, around the world, but also uh, will carry the necessary resistant genes. So it's a combination of the background of the banana genome with the novel resistant genes. Next slide, please. Uh, just to give you a quick example that uh, this work in banana is, is, is quite elaborate if you compare it to many other crops. Uh, development of segregating populations in banana is quite challenging. And if you want to, uh, this is an example of how we are trying to also find the genes that are responsible for resistance. So first of all, we need to uh, make the crossing populations and then each of the segregants needs to be multiplied to have enough plants to do a screening. Next slide. That in itself is a challenge to have big enough population. And this is also one of the tasks that we are doing in the IITA projects. This is an example of how that works. Once we have multiplied these segregating plants, we are exposing them to the fungus in a greenhouse setting. That is uh, a very controlled way of doing it, of which we can be sure that the results that we have are good enough to be used for genetic analysis. We, because if you want to use it for genetic analysis, the, the results have to be pretty precise. Otherwise, you will not be able to link the genetic makeup with the phenotype that you score in these plants. So we do that uh, in very controlled conditions. And this is an example of the segregating plants from a population that we made that all score resistance. So they have inherited the gene for resistance or the genes for resistance from the parent. And the next slide, you see the opposite. Another part of the population will, will not have inherited the resistant genes. And if we then challenge those plants, they look like this. This gives us an opportunity, if we get results like this, to actually, on the next slide, release a genotyping experiment on these same plants and then map exactly the location in which the genotype corresponds to the phenotype. And that gives us a location on the genome that that carries this resistant. And once we know that, we can develop molecular markers and use them in our uh, crossing and segregation schemes. So next slide, please. That is uh, very useful for the breeders. But what we also would like to do is to get to really understanding what are the genes that are responsible for this resistant. For that, we also look at what we call the transcriptome. So that means which genes are being expressed when you challenge the plants with the fungus and whether it's a resistant or a susceptible reaction. And that gives us a different, what we call a transcriptome profiles of all of these interactions over time. And that helps us to narrow down the, the genes that are responsible for this resistance reaction. Next slide. We put all this data in, uh, in, in modern uh, databases that can, uh, that can search for resistant genes because we know, as I said in the beginning, from other plants and from other crops, which genes uh, are usually have the signature that gives resistance. So this is the way where we come from genetics to the genes that are responsible for the resistances. And once we know that, 
uh, the breeding process is much, much more effective. Next slide. So uh, you might wonder why we set this up in Wageningen and, and, and that seems a bit difficult because there are no bananas growing in Wageningen. Uh, so what we also had to do is to set up all the things you need to do as a breeder for making crosses. And we do that in controlled greenhouses here indeed in Wageningen. So we set up tropical greenhouses that are really high so that the bananas can grow high. That's where we grow all our wild germplasm and when we make the crosses between the different accessions the deliberate crosses of the ones that have the genotypes that we are looking for to combine in the varieties. That has been quite a challenge because uh, crossing is not easy in bananas. You need good uh, pollen viability. Uh, the seeds are very easily deteriorate in quality. So all this has to be set up in order to make this a success. And now we have that on the control after the first uh, three years of research. So we are now able to scale up this uh, significantly in the next uh, years. Next slide, please. And at the same time, we are setting up uh, that uh, field trial uh, uh, location in the Philippines so that the, the, the varieties that we will develop can also be tested in the field. So it's, it's nice to have the results from the greenhouse about the resistances, but in the end, we also want to see how they perform in fields so for that, our partner Musarades is, is uh, setting up these field trial locations so that we can test the novel genetics also in these locations in the coming years, once we get them out of the greenhouse. Next slide, which I think is the last one. And with that, I'd like to thank you for uh, the opportunity to present our work here today. Thank you very much, Dr. Uh, Dr. Kema and, and Mr. Sorensen, it was very interesting, your presentation. According to the agenda, we decided that we will leave the, the QA, the questions and answers section, until the, the end of the, of the second um, block of, of, uh, of presentations. So if that's okay, we will continue with the agenda. So for that, I would like to now continue with the Formosana experience in Asia. And for that, I would like to give the floor to Dr. Agustin Molina, who is a research and development expert and technical advisor of the Department of Agriculture of the Philippines. He holds a PhD in plant pathology by the Pennsylvania State University and is internationally recognized for, for his significant contributions to the research and development, particularly in the areas of integrated pest and disease management with emphasis on fusarium wilt and banana bunkito disease. Agustin has been actively involved in the global research efforts addressing important pests and diseases, conservation and use of banana genetic diversity, particularly in Asia and the Pacific. He has worked on TIA4 for more than two decades with regional partners in the scientific and industry sectors in the Philippines, Asia, and as a senior scientist and regional coordinator of Biodiversity International for Asia and the Pacific. He will present now the Formosana experience in Asia with a focus on the Philippines. Dr. Molina, thank you very much. And we really appreciate that you are still to you bear with us, uh, even though it's very late in the Philippines. So thank you. And the screen is yours. You need to unmute your microphone, please. Now. Yes, uh, now I have to put, now I... If you'd like to share your screen, I will stop sharing and then you will have the bottom to share it yes, as okay. this morning. Yes, yeah, you can share my screen now. Mm, yes, I will, not, talk, uh, I will not, talk with my screen. Not, not yet. You need to click in the bottom that we identified this morning. He says share stream in the lower part of the browser. Ah, I cannot see it now. I am. Uh, it's in the lower part of the browser. Uh, yeah, I, below participants, you will see it's a, a green bottom. It's highlighted because usually for panelists, it's in green. Hi, and my. Can you still hear me? We can hear you sound and clear, yes. Yes, I cannot find my 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 presentation now here. No worries, this is precisely why we have a plan B. 
And the plan B is, yeah. is that I will present it for you. And then you will just let, need to let me know when I am supposed to move to the next slide. Oh, Can you please say, uh, Dr. Molina? Yes, uh, let, let me see, because I have uh, some changes. I have uh, removed some... Oh my goodness, I, it was working earlier. Now it is... Uh... Do you identify? Hello. Can you still hear me? We can hear you, yes. Yeah, yeah I, I, you might as well use my, my screen. My, my, the presentation that I, I sent to you. Yes, it's, it's in the screen already. I cannot. Mine is, uh, I cannot see anything here. Shall I launch the meeting again? No, wait a second. Mateus, can you confirm that you can see the PowerPoint in full screen? Yes, I can see, Victor. Full screen, isn't it? Yes. Dr. Molina, everybody can see your screen. I, I am inside one. Oh, no, I think we lost him. Okay, I would really appreciate if uh, our panelists and participants have a little yes, bit of patience. Uh, okay, Dr. Molina. Can, I, will I will share my, my screen. Uh, you you no, found I, it? I can find it. Yes, I can find it now. Okay, this first the bottom. You cannot start screen share while the other participant is sharing. It says here. That's why I didn't try try again, please. No, I cannot. I, <laughs> I am not sharing my screen now. There's no one. There are no screens shared. Dr. Molina, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you now. Uh, let's go back to your screen. And, and, and I have no problem. I have a problem here with my okay. screen. Okay, now I am sharing okay. your PowerPoint. Yeah. I mean, slide it's, one. Uh, uh, good afternoon to everyone. And uh, uh, it's already midnight here. And I'm, I, I hope I can uh, finish my presentation without sleeping. Uh, next slide, please. Next slide, please. Yeah, my presentation will revolve around my experiences, our experiences in Asia, Pacific, on the use of a resistant variety called Pormosana. And uh, I suppose to start my, my presentation with uh, the obvious uh, uh, institute that produced the, the, the variety Pormosana, that's the Taiwan Banana Research Institute, which used a very conventional uh, breeding approach but um, uh, I would like to start it from the Philippines, uh, where I was based as the regional coordinator of Asia Pacific of Biodiversity International, because uh, it's in the Philippines uh, is the biggest Cavendish producer for uh, the trade uh, in the whole uh, of Asia. It's actually number one, and uh, you can see in the in the, in the <clears throat> slide that it's uh, 85,000 hectares. It's a major. Uh, uh, source of revenue in the Philippines, actually banana is number two export, uh, agricultural export in the Philippines. Uh, next slide, please. Next slide, please. And uh, the tropical race for uh, started in the Philippines in the year 2000, very early. I just joined the biodiversity, biodiversity at that time, but I'm very familiar with tropical race for because I was the research director of Jakita in the 1990s when uh, we established plantations in Indonesia and Malaysia. And it was um, abandoned because of the attack of uh, TR4. So in 2000, I, I was seeing already the infection in the bow. It, uh, it continued to progress, but we were not kind of people, we were not kind of attentive because they thought it was the original, it's a, a more mild uh, strain of Peradum uh, uh, disease. Well, of course, it, uh, it's uh, the, the virulent TR4. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. So in uh, 
2006, we did the survey to verify what exactly is this new epidemic. Uh, so we did the survey in 2005. My objective then was to convince the industry that there is, we are dealing a new and virulent disease. So in 2006, we confirmed with Stellenbosch University that it's actually BCG 1316 tropical race for. And uh, I used that uh, for developmental purpose to make sure that the industry will have to change their, uh, change their approach in research and in, in the mitigation uh, process. And so, uh, but this was not published or uh, reported in international uh, forum until uh, 2008, which I reported in the Pipe of Society meeting in, uh, in Honolulu. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. So uh, obviously there is a question of, uh, of uh, management, of disease management. And what do we have? Uh, the first thing that comes to mind is uh, uh, resistant variety. Any disease for that matter, any plant pathologist or any farmer would, uh, for that matter, they would ask for a res resistant variety if you have a problem like that. And we have the conventional breeding program uh, that has been going on in Latin America. Uh, I am very familiar with this because I said I work for Chiquita brands and we developed varieties uh, through Philro uh, that we donated later to FIA uh, that uh, is uh, that high yielding, uh, but very susceptible to, uh, but uh, not acceptable in the market. So it was uh, not, uh, it did not enter the trade uh, industry. And of course, at that time in 1990, I was still with the Chiquita. We were looking already with collaboration with the molecular biologist uh, using um, GMO approach uh, for black cigatoka. And unfortunately, we did not have a very successful um, pursuit on that direction. And of course, it's still the process that uh, uh, many scientists are, uh, are um, trying to pursue, which is a, a legitimate uh, pursuit. Uh, however, there is uh, a, a breeding program in Taiwan because uh, Taiwan was the first uh, um, uh, industry that was uh, attacked by TR4, and that is the selection uh, of uh, resistant variety. Next slide, please. Against TR4. Next slide, please. Now, the Taiwan Banana Research Institute um, uh, was uh, a, a very important institute to protect their industry. Their main problem before was the typhoon uh, and the product, so they have to plant every year. And so they, they were the first one to develop or commercialize the in vitro mass propagation. But at the same time, it was an opportunity for selecting the variants in the field because their approach uh, is very unique. You cannot do this approach in the laboratories. You have to do that in the field where you have a population of plant and you have a disease in the soil to serve as selection pressure. And uh, you use the, uh, you select that in the field. Next slide, please. And uh, when once this is an opportunity, next slide, please. Next slide. Hey, Dr. Molina, you, you need to wait uh, because from the moment I click the bottom until you see it, there's a small uh, time elapse. So it takes a, a few seconds for your information. Okay. Yeah, okay. So the, this approach uh, requires a population and uh, they involved, they involved uh, the farmers. So it was a farmer's uh, participatory selection where they um, supply the seedlings uh, in millions of seedlings in thousands of hectares of, uh, of uh, soil uh, infested with the, uh, with the uh, pathogen. Okay. The next slide will show you how, how, how they do it. Okay, so in the plant, um, uh, in the farm, they, the, the farmers select survivors in a severely infected plant. And, and the assumption here, and I think this is based on science, is that in tissue culture, the, uh, the process of tissue culture, mass propagation, you are creating off types or variants. And there could be a favorable variance. 
and that favorable variant is a resistance uh, resistance to a disease in this case posarium wilt and that is selected uh, in the in the field by way of, of survival or uh, or death of the plants and any infected uh, healthy plant they the farmer will bring that to the tbri and they will uh, verify it and they plant them again in screening heavy infested soil and the selected lines are subjected to field verification for resistance, yield, agronomic traits, et cetera. Now, this approach is very, uh, is very uh, unique because the population that is selected or the individual that is selected is already most likely agronomically or in, in terms of quality are similar to the, uh, uh, from the parent plants. If there is a, a variation, very small. Next slide, please. Now, uh, as a regional coordinator of Biodiversity International for Asia Pacific, Taiwan Banana Research Institute is a member of my network. So I coordinated uh, different um, countries uh, in Asia, like China, India, the Philippines, etc. And Taiwan Banana Research Institute is a member of our network. And uh, they shared these varieties as early as 2002. Uh, as 2002, and I was able to, con to convince the TBRI to share in good faith uh, for global public goods for uh, for testings in Asia, especially. Uh, next slide, please. In the Philippines, we focus on the Philippines because it is an area where, uh, as I told you, there is an epidemic, and uh, so the first evaluation of GCTCBs were in the Philippines was in 2006. The first batches of GCTCBs that I got, next slide, please, the, was um, uh, uh, GCTCB 119. Uh, I evaluated these varieties together with the local varieties because I was concerned that uh, what about if we have this epidemic? What is what about the local varieties, which are very important to, to the local uh, 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 economy? Uh, for farmers, and uh, well, we found out that Lakatan and Latondan uh, are very susceptible. Cardaba, which is the Saba, is very resistant, together with Cloenamua. But what was surprising was GCTCB 119, which was very resistant to TR4. Unfortunately, 119 is very tall variety late maturing and the number of hands were very small, but it is very, very sweet. Some companies tried it, but they cannot uh, 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 commercialize it because of the, uh, the agronomic um, uh, deficiencies. Next slide, please. So in 2008, I again convinced um, TBRI to share other uh, GCTCBs. And in that case, so in that time, we got 105, 218, 219. 219, by the way, is a selection that we made in the Philippines uh, from 109 and grand name. So we did this evaluation again from 2008 to 2011. And out of this evaluation, we identified 218 and 219 to, be, to have potential. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. And from small trials, we went into commercial trials with a company that is uh, severely affected by the disease. We evaluated the 218 and 219 compared to Grand Nain, not on small plots, but uh, we are talking of 11,200 seedlings, which is uh, about 5, 000, 5 uh, hectares. And uh, we, did, we ran that for uh, several years. And we, uh, we have seen that uh, 218, uh, 219 is really very uh, resistant. 219, 218 is very, it's not that resistant, but it is uh, compared to granane, it's very acceptable. But the advantage of 218, it has a very good agronomic traits, similar, almost similar to, to, to Williams and uh, granane in terms of yield and quality. Next slide, please. So there was a series of experiments. Uh, and <clears throat> from that stage, and I'd like to point this out, all of my activities here in Asia, I work with the industry and research institutions. So it was partnership. 
And um, so uh, I, I, we evaluated semi-commercial with uh, different companies, Lapandai, small uh, company like Mauro, Dole, Tadeco is a big company. Uh, and the, the result was uh, phenomenal. There, I have been presenting these uh, results in international fora, but well, uh, there were some skeptics who, don't, who did not believe it, but at least uh, my, the industry believed what uh, they were seeing. Next slide, please. So in 2014, next, next slide, please. In 2014, we have a very good demonstration that you see in the left slide, February 21, 2012, this farm was abandoned, totally destroyed. In, so I took the picture in the left uh, picture in 2017, but we rehabilitated that in 2018 uh, of the GCTCB 218 in 2014. So the industry was really, uh, was really convinced that this is the way to go in the absence of any other variety because the industry was uh, already kind of in, in danger. Next slide, please. So I just would like to show you uh, the stage, stage of adoption by commercial companies. Next slide, please. The obvious step when they commercialize it, to use it in commercial scale, is to mass produce 218. So each company had their nurseries of producing 218 for their rehabilitation and expansion programs. This is not, uh, those are evidences uh, of, of the success of 218. Next slide, please. And this is a slide uh, provided by the company, and this uh, they presented this in several uh, meetings uh, that we had in the Philippines, and even I think uh, Tadeko presented that in Boston during the uh, meeting in 2017. Uh, by 2017, Tadeko had uh, been using had replanted 1,140 hectares. That is not experiment. That's already actual life uh, situation. 2017. And now we are talking of 2022. Imagine how much, uh, how many 218 they have already. Gold in 2018 they reported already almost 4,000 hectares. So it is very well adopted or used by farmers in the Philippines. Next slide, please. And last week, uh, recently. Uh, because uh, since the, two years ago when pandemic came, I was I did not have the chance anymore to visit Davao, but I'm monitoring what's happening. And uh, in August 2021, just uh, last year, there is this company, 370 hectares, uh, totally destroyed in 2015, and they rehabilitated it with UCL4, which is GCTCB218. Next slide, please. And last week. I asked the vice president of technical services of one of the biggest company uh, by phone, ask him what is now the status, and he told me uh, this is in in uh, act, this is actual. It is safe to say that 218 is used in all rehabilitation programs and in most expansion plantings. It says that 218 saved the banana industry from destruction of TR4. Next slide, please. So the industry has developed or has accepted this as a tool to manage uh, TR4 in the Philippines. Uh, the, the thing is that uh, 218 is now selected or mass produced by each company. And each company has a name already. La Panda Fruits, they call it LFC75. Tadeco call it TDC7. But at least they recognize that it is 218. Dole is SF120. Dole is a standard fruit. Uniproti, it's UCL4. Even Rahan, you know, Rahan is selling a C4, commercializing it not only in the Philippines, but worldwide. They are promoting it, C4. But it is Uniproti CL4. It is GCTCB218. Um, because uh, the, 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 the guy who selected UCL4 is, I know him quite well, because we, he collaborated with me before. Next slide, please. 
Our problem, though, however, is that the small growers do not have this infrastructure for good quality seedlings. So there are a lot of variations. You know, to, uh, to one eight, when it's not uh, properly selected and managed, you can have a lot of variation. So the small growers have inferior quality of 218, inadequate care and inputs. And, uh, but the, the big uh, uh, companies, they have good selection and they are very satisfied with 218. I know what a 218 is. Uh, I just look at the plant, I know what it is. Uh, sometimes they call it with other variety, but actually it's 218. Next slide, please. Now, 218 is also, uh, uh, GCTCBs from TBRI had also helped other countries. Next slide, slide please. Yes, Dr. Marina, I, I see that you still have uh, 14 slides uh, and, and we are no, running out of time. No, 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 this, this one, you, you, you just mm -hmm. simply press it uh, rapidly. But the thing is, you're, it's in Sumatra, in Indonesia, they're using it since 2006. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. And the, the commercialization. Uh, now, this uh, I, that was in Indonesia. I would like to uh, talk a little bit, maybe two minutes, for Mozambique. I visited Mozambique with uh, Dr. Altos uh, in 2013. 90% of the farm was infested already. They had ineffective biosecurity. They don't know the disease, etc. They have financial issues. Next slide, please. And by 2015, they were about to abandon the plant. Uh, the plantation. I recommended, we recommended that they used 218 because at that time we were using already in the Philippines. Uh, so we provided uh, for testings in Matanuska uh, as early as 2016. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> but uh, by the end of 2017, Matanuska, by 2017, they had planted 500,000 directly sourced from TBRI. And early 2018, the company closed because of lack of operational money not because of Formosana failed, as some alleged. By mid-2018, Jacaranda Limited bought Matanoska. They rehabilitated it. They used uh, Formosana. So next slide, please. And this is the a picture that I got from, from Jacaranda to prove that it's, uh, they have used these varieties, the seedlings they use, they got it from, Formosa, from TBRI. Next slide, please. Well, I just would like to make this quotation uh, from Dr. Uh, Huang. S.C. Huang is the father of all these GCTCBs, the former director of TBRI. He says, the success of TBRI in selecting and commercializing resistant covenants against PR4 demonstrates a novel and practical method of banana bream improvement program, a feat that conventional breeding and GMO approach have not achieved in many years in spite of huge investment. That is the word of Dr. Wang whenever we invite him to talk during our meeting. Next slide, please. <clears throat> now, TBRI is uh, um, continuously improving their system. And they have uh, 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 the latest improvement is 218, the Formosana, that was developed in 2002. In 2017, they have selected an improved 218, and they have this in their portfolio. It's not yet available. This is the, uh, their field of Formosana. Formosana and TC number eight is the improved 218. And this is available uh, for, uh, yeah, next slide, please. It has characteristic of shorter high, uh, of, uh, height, uh, fruit less uh, susceptible to trips and maturity stain, earlier harvest, bunch configuration better, ripened one day faster. So PBRI has continuously improved their system through their somaclonal uh, selection, their method. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. And uh, next slide, please. Next slide. Uh, I, I, uh, with the, uh, the uh, this uh, as a summary, Formosana is the most significant technology developed and available to manage TR4 epidemic. And this is available to uh, everyone who wants to collaborate with them. 
Um, and um, uh, while waiting for a better variety we have produced by other breeding programs, 218 is, uh, is a variety that could be useful elsewhere. Next, next slide, please. The predictions of death, uh, you know, uh, this was a uh, new scientist as early as 2003. They had predicted that bananas will die a natural death if we don't do breeding programs. And that was the time that we were uh, promoting GM or genomic research. Uh, and then in 2013, some people uh, predicted that uh, by 20, uh, by in five years, uh, bananas will not be there anymore, which is okay. The, it had created uh, interest of so many people and had created a lot of uh, investments in, in banana research. Uh, but until they have that, I believe that the, the program of, um, of uh, approach of somaclonal selection in the tropics. You cannot do that in, in Europe or anywhere else. It must be done in the tropics where you produce it. Next slide, please. Well, I would like to say, I would like to say that uh, this, uh, uh, I would say, success story of 218 is not a product of overnight uh, simplified uh, narrative like this. It's a partnership that I put together, engaging the industry, research institutions, not only in the Philippines, but uh, uh, the whole of Asia. I, we have good partners in China, in India, and in Australia, uh, and other countries, and including Stellenbosch University, who help us a lot. Uh, and uh, biodiversity, uh, I coordinated this. Uh, it's not my work alone. It is a win-win uh, um, -win good collaboration. So that is the story of 218. Thank you. Dr. Molina, thank you very much for the insightful information provided out of the Formosana experience in Asia. It was really interesting. Now I'd like to give the floor to uh, Dr. Altus Biljoin as a professor in plant pathology in Stellenbosch University in South Africa. He is an authority in Banana Fusarium and, and has been working on the disease for more than 20 years now. His uh, research involves many aspects related to Fusarium will, including diagnostics, plant resistance, and integrated disease management. His research group also focused on fungal genetics and genomics, epidemiology, and the isolation and identification of genes associated with disease resistance in plants. Professor Bill Join coordinates an African consortium dealing with uh, Fusarium Tropical Race 4, collaborates with many banana researchers globally, has been invited as a keynote speaker at several uh, scientific conferences, and has published numerous scientific articles on banana Fusarium wheat. Um, Prof, uh, Professor Biljoin will present some of his research on Formosana and on the cultivation of the Soma clone in Africa. Dr. Biljoin, please, the screen is yours. Thank you very much, Victor, for the introduction. Um, I hope this is the, the new version that I sent to you this morning. I believe it will be. Indeed. Right. Um, I have listed a number of names here for actually talking about the performance of Formosana in Southern Africa, because most of us, our work is being done in Mozambique, and that is done in collaboration with Jacaranda uh, Banana Company, where Gladys Tazan and Suren Surensen are the managers of, of the setup over there. So they have also provided me with quite a bit of information of what I will be presenting. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Next slide. Right, I think just to give a little bit of perspective of the importance of Cavendish bananas in Africa, and I'm mentioning specifically this because Formosana is a Cavendish type. It's not a cooking banana, and cooking banana is the major type of banana grown in the continent. Uh, Cavendish makes up only about 9% of all the bananas, and it's grown mostly in the southern African region, um, and then also on the East African coastline uh, by some companies that is investing over there. 
And then if you go up to Somalia, uh, Sudan, um, Ethiopia, there is also quite a bit of, of Cavendish being grown. And then obviously in West Africa, it's grown in Cameroon, Ivory Coast, with some exports going into Europe. But it's, it's a rather small group of it. Thank you, you can go back. No, go back. Right. Um, just to, let me just try to clean up. Okay. Just to summarize briefly, there's a number of strategies to improve banana for resistance to TR4. Um, and James Taylor's one time very nicely summarized it in saying that there are long-term strategies, intermediate-term strategies, and, and short-term strategies. What I'm going to focus on is the short-term strategies and the somoclonal variant uh, for Busana mostly. But one should also realize that there's another mutation breeding strategy which is calling induced which is called induced mutagenesis that can be done with chemical mutations or by physical mutations. And we're not going to discuss this at this meeting, but I think it's a, an important strategy that needs to be followed. And the reason why we are excited about the mutation breeding is obviously the time involved. It is a shorter strategy as the, the other two. Um, it also doesn't require that you need to know what are the genes that you need to target with genetic modification or, or even gene editing. And obviously working on a Cavendish banana will give you a taste that is true to the typical export banana that we have and, and the Cavendish banana. So there won't be any taste issues. Next slide, please. I think I'm gonna skip the next two slides simply for time constraints. I know that we are running a little bit out of time. So this is just the, the process of somoclonal variation. Let's go to the next slide. And this is for metagenesis. So I'm gonna skip this as well. Please go to the next slide. Right, so basically the testing of Formosana or GCTCB218, that it's all, what is also known in Africa has started almost 20 years ago when we tested um, an earlier version of GCTCV218 in, in the subtropical banana growing areas of South Africa, where we've got a, a different strain of Fusarium wilt called subtropical race four. Um, and since then, obviously, I have seen the development of some clone and seen how it's been improved and also planted in other countries. And certainly this also led to the recommendation when there was a problem in Mozambique that we should test some of the somoclones coming from Taiwan. Next slide, please. Right, so just to give you an idea of the situation in Mozambique, um, this is on the east coast of Africa. The only sites that had really been affected are two different plantations. One was the Matanushka original uh, plantation um, that was severely affected. And then the Jacaranda plantations that's on the Lurio River up in the north. Um, but for the trials that we decided to do, we thought of doing the TR4 resistance screening at Matanushka because it was so severely contaminated. And then in a clean field site to do some horticultural traits that we also wanted to evaluate of the different varieties. Um, it was a comprehensive, it was a big trial. It consisted of uh, 40 plants replicated five times. So 200 plants of each summer clone that we've actually tested. Um, and it was done over two years. Next slide, please. Right, so these are some of the summer clones that Gus has already mentioned, um, GCTCV 106, 119, 218, which is the Formosana, and then 247. And these were all identified by Professor Wong as those ones that showed good resistance to TR4 up in uh, Taiwan. And then we've also included EPM25, which is a dwarf profit mutant. Um, this has been developed by mutagenesis, gamma ray irradiation. 
Um, and then finally, we also included a susceptible Cavendish cultivar called Nandi, which is a local selection over there. Next slide. Right, the, the rating, just very briefly, was done on a rating scale of one to five. Um, how we evaluated and compared the different semiclones was to measure the disease under the, the area under the disease progress curve over two years. That means we did a rating every month and then just see how the disease developed over time. Next slide, please. Right. Um, so on the right-hand side, in the top picture, you can see the average disease rating that was in the first season of the plant crop. And on the bottom, you can see that the GCTCVs are actually doing much, much better than the regular Cavendish types, the Nandi, as well as the DPM25, um, that showed much more disease development over there. The bottom is just a re results of the first return. Um, and while those bars look quite high for the GCTCVs, this is all calculated according to the area under the disease progress curve. So it does look much more than it is. Um, but in the end, the, one can see that the GCTCV, as Gus mentioned earlier, clearly performed best. And that was followed by GCTCV 218 or the Formasana. Next slide, please. We also looked at a number of production traits. That is the cycle time, um, the serostem or the plant height, as well as uh, diameter, the number of leaves, and also some traits of the, of, of the fruit that's produced afterwards. Next slide, please. So I'm just gonna highlight a, a few of these. Um, the Nandi, as I said, is a local Cavendish cultivar. And if you look on the left green column over there in the, in the top for the plant crop, you can see that the Cavendish is no doubt a much faster grower than the Soma clones. Um, so this is something that we knew for, for a long time. For the first return, we actually saw that the second cycle is much faster for the for Musana but still not as fast as a typical or normal Cavendish cultivar. In terms of bunch weight, um, the GCTCV218 actually did very, very well. It produced the, the best bunch in the first season. And the two, second season, it was also quite similar to the Cavendish types. Um, so the bunch size was very similar to that. So it's basically simply cycle time that made the, the total yield per year uh, slightly less than the regular Cavendish bananas. Next slide, please. Right, so Gus also mentioned that Matanushka was destroyed by TR4 within four years. It is probably the worst outbreak of TR4 that I've seen in any country. Um, and I've seen it in, in many different countries. Mm -hmm. At the moment, 750 hectares of the former Matanushka has been replanted by Jacaranda Company that's now owned the, the place. And another 250 hectares is being planted near the Lurio River. So that's a little bit up in the north. Um, losses due to Fusarium world range at the moment between five and 20%. Um, we still try to analyze what's the reason for the variation, but it, it could also be Soil inoculum levels that differ, that differ between the, the different spots where we reported this data. Um, most of these plants are meristems coming from TBRI. So it, it's actually the plants in tissue culture that perform very, very well. Um, it's, it's also interesting to know that the national and the international markets accepted uh, the fruit very, very well. Um, so certainly there's, there's no problem with the market issue. Uh, Victor, I can unfortunately not, not see the last point down there, but let's leave it and go to the next slide. Right, so this is an interesting graph shared uh, with me by the people from Jacaranda. And, and you can see these graphs 
graphs at the top uh, that showed quite a number of plants that got infected per hectare. And then suddenly in week 12, 10, 12, 14 of the next year, um, the incidence became much less. And uh, the jacaranda stuff really believes that this is due to the treatment of the soil with composts and also composts um, mixed with a number of beneficial microbes. It's either EM, effective microbes that they in, incorporated there, or trichodermis that they incorporated that. So it is quite important to support the formosana and not think that it's standalone um, to actually solve your problem. Next slide. So in conclusion, Formosana is now fully replaced susceptible Cavendish bananas in the TR4 affected fields in Mozambique, but it's not being planted yet in any of the non-infested fields uh, on the continent um, commercially. Uh, I know there are trials going on. The horticultural traits and food taste of Formosana is, is good. Um, actually, the people from Jacaranda also shared to me that it's fixed better prices than normal bananas on some markets. The cultivation of it, as I said just now, needs to be supported by integrated disease management programs. So it, it's not a standalone. And finally, it is not an immune plant. One should remember that. Um, but for now, that is the only thing. If you have Fusarium TR4 in your fields, there's absolutely nothing else available for you. Um, and it's doing pretty well. And one can continue farming banana still um, economically if, if you plant this. Final slide. Next slide. Right, thank you very much. This is the end of my talk. I think everyone that's involved in the work in Africa on Forum Sana is uh, participating in this webinar. So you can ask questions to any one of us if there's an opportunity. Yes, thank you very much, Dr. Vijayan. Highly appreciated, very interesting information. Now, um, I am mindful of the time, and then we don't have much time. In fact, uh, if we follow the agenda, only three minutes. Maybe we can allocate 10 minutes now for a QA session, questions and answers. And if we have time, we can, of course, uh, continue replying questions after we finish the, the presentation of the last panelist. Um, I would like to close here by saying that, of course, we will have more opportunities to uh, formulate more questions in other webinars, but also please do not hesitate if you have questions to send them to both panelists or the World Bank Forum Secretariat, and we will be happy to include that in the report and, of course, address those questions. So I would like to give the floor now to uh, my colleague in the World Bank Forum Secretariat, Mateus Lima, uh, who collected some questions. We decided to rescue two or three questions each um, and then leave the rest to the other questions for another occasion. Mateus, you are the screen. Thank you. Thank you very much, Victor. Uh, one question that, that was uh, repeated a lot of time is regarding the market acceptance, regarding the flavor and texture of Formosana. So I would like to ask Dr. Molina and Autos as well. If uh, is how is the market acceptance? There was also interest regarding the stability of the soma clone. So these two these two questions in one. To be brief, please. Thank you. Please, Dr. Molina, two minutes. Thank you. Yes, uh, there's no uh, there's no problem uh, that it is accepted by the market. The fact that more than ten thousand hectares are already sold by commercial companies in different markets in Asia, so it's accepted. There is a problem in China uh, because um, the way ones who are what are uh, uh, shipped to China are mostly produced by small growers, which are um, don't have the capability to produce good quality plants. It's not because of the of the variety, because the variety the well, Formosana is good. In fact, it is a little bit sweet, uh, sweeter than the regular Cavendish. It's accepted, no problem. Mateus, do you have the question? Please go ahead. Thank you. Yes. Uh, other question was regarding the stability of the soma clone in the field. If the soma clone behave, how is the behavior of the stability of the soma clone? If you can also comment, very brief, or Altus. Can 
Altus will answer or I will? Yeah, I can. I... Esther, te paso la palabra. Go ahead. Go ahead, guys. Uh, Purmusana in the Philippines is uh, relatively stable. There's not, uh, the, there is, however, an observation that we have uh, the observed uh, quite some time ago that the GCTCBs in general are uh, floaters. They float. And therefore, if they are not managed properly in terms of drainage and uh, et cetera, uh, the, the, there is a decline in yield. But with good management, that's, that should not be a problem. In terms of variability, going back, there is uh, an observed variation, uh, variability or variance, especially when they do uh, a lot of tissue culture and they don't know how to select the mother plants. And that is true to small growers. But in terms of stability of resistance, it is, uh, it is very stable. Okay. Dr. Molina, thank you very much um, for the information. I just opened the microphone of our colleague uh, working with the subregional office in Panama, the Mesoamerica office, Esther. Is your microphone working now? Esther Peralta, can you please check if your sí, microphone Sí, is... perdón, era que estaba reconectando. Absolutely, please go ahead. Bueno, yo, yo creo que de las cosas más importantes eh, que se han hablado, eh, es, eh, y, y hay varias preguntas, eh, está todo lo relacionado con el manejo si hay especificaciones sobre bioseguridad, sobre manejo orgánico o manejo de microorganismos. Sería bueno que eh, eh, los ponentes pudieran eh, comentar al respecto y de igual manera si hay alguna experiencia en el uso de energía atómica para la obtención de variedades o de clones resistentes a la raza 4 tropical. Gracias. Dr. Kema, uh, perhaps, or... Um, yeah, can you quickly then translate the question, uh, Victor, because the translation didn't work. Okay, then maybe we should uh, have informed interpretation. I would like then to ask Esther again to formulate the question, and please, um, interpreters, you need to switch, you need to go to the English channel and and provide a simultaneous interpretation from Spanish into English. So uh, please if, go to the English channel. Victor, yeah? Victor if I may, uh, I may answer the la pregunta de Esther. I, I, think, the, I, think it will be, I think it will be good if Dr. Kema replies now. Okay, uh, go ahead. Thank you. Because my interpretation is that what are the protocols in terms of, uh, of biological control, etc., in managing for Musana, I suppose, uh, so um, it was about maybe Musana, Dr. Kema can answer it. Esther, it was about for Musana. Yes. Ah, okay, then, then sorry. Then yes, for Musana and, and in general, the resistant or, tol or tolerant the summer clones or uh, clones in general. Okay, so then for Musana, please for Mr. Molina. But uh, the, 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 the answer uh, of Valverde about uh, atomic energy for the new clones, that is important, the opinion of uh, different uh, uh, persons which are uh, participant, uh, par participant in this uh, webinar. Thank you, Esther. So, Dr. Molina, please go ahead with from Osana. We go with an atomic energy uh, with our colleagues from well, like, Asia and yeah. Bagaring. <laughs> If I understood well, the question of Esther is about it was, she was uh, asking whether there are already, there are standard or protocol how to manage for Musana with the other uh, treatments like bio, uh, bi, uh, bi, uh, bi, uh, biological organisms and 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 farming practices. Uh, this question is not easy to answer in sci uh, right now because I uh, I think Altos will agree with me that. Uh, 
know, most of these types of activities around a variety is developed more by the companies. They, and every company has different types of production system. And each company develops their own. So uh, uh, there are, uh, uh, Esther, there are protocols already developed by these companies. It's just a matter of, uh, into, uh, of uh, knowing that they are, they, they are good researchers too. Thank you. Dr. Kim? If he wants to reply, of course. Yes, I, or I think so. Mr. Or Mr. Soresen. Well, I mean, as, oh. as sorry, here I am, yeah. But as uh, as Gus said, you know, I, I cannot comment on the management of TO4 in Formazana. We are just not active in that region, so. The, I think, I think uh, there was a second part of the questions, which might be repeated about mutation breeding. Um, my Spanish is not very good. Yes, maybe. Okay, so Esther, what was the question? Esther. In Spanish. <laughs> yeah. Okay, well. Hay preguntas acerca de las posibilidades del uso de energía atómica para eh, la obtención de, de variedades resistentes o tolerantes. Si, si tienen alguna fundamentación sobre eso o algunos resultados, sería eh, útil para la audiencia. Do you need my translation, Hurt? Yes, please. Yeah, he, she's, she's asking whether uh, you have any knowledge, knowledge on whether uh, atomic energy can be useful to, uh, to, obtain, to obtain a new resistant varieties. Yeah. Uh, yeah, well, I'm not sure. I mean, um, if you look at what's being presented now, and for instance, the work that will be presented by Dr. Piatovra and Miristem, I believe that the technology that's being used in these companies uh, has already shown that, yeah, we can select uh, resistant material. And I have not seen that yet from the, uh, the program uh, from Jena in, uh, in Austria. So, um, but of course, as you understand from our presentation, uh, we are not objecting to mutation breeding, don't take me wrong. Uh, but of course, mutation breeding is not diversifying the crop as it should be. I mean, that's what we do with classical breeding, right? And, um, and as we've shown also in our presentation, we'd rather not focus just on TR4 uh, because Black Sea is um, at least equal and in many countries a way more important problem than Fusarian wilt. And so we believe that diversifying the crop is eventually really necessary um, with a focus on these major fungal diseases. So I hope this answers uh, the question, Esther. You're, you're muted. Yeah. Yes. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, there, there are many people that uh, are a question. Yeah, sure. Okay. Thank, thank you. you. Can I add to that, please? Yeah, go ahead. From a technical point of view, I think uh, uh, mutation breeding in general is a very, very nice tool, very good tool that can be used uh, and has been used in many cases in other crops to develop resistant germplasm. The problem with the triploid sterile uh, Cavendish, however, is that most mutation occurrences result in, uh, let's say, uh, not in a dominant phenotype. So it usually results in a resistant phenotype. So if you don't have the means to cross that back and select for the correct uh, homozygous dominant uh, effect, um, the, you know, mutation breeding is not that effective. If you are able to combine the two, cross selection and mutation breeding, that would be the most uh, efficient uh, breeding method in my view, from a technical point of view. Thank you so much. Question to Dr. Sorensen, if okay. I may. Uh, I'm, I'm, afraid, I'm, I'm, I'm afraid, Dr. Molina, I, I'm, I'm really sorry, but I have some technical okay. issues and, and we are uh, a bit, um, we, we're not really good in, with, with the agenda. Can you please hold on until the end of the webinar? If we have time, we will continue with the questions and answers. Would that be possible, Dr. Molina? 
I am I am not, I am ready to hit the bed so I'm signing off. Thank you. Dr. Molina, um, I'm sorry we are 10 minutes late. Uh, <laughs> is that that's the only reason why? And then uh, please, I have an issue with interpretation. I keep on receiving messages. Interpretation in Spanish is not working. We need maybe to change again the interpreter because the uh, sound comes and goes, meaning we have more than 500 participants, most of them speaking Spanish. We, we really appreciate if interpreters can maybe speak closer to the microphone or fix this uh, technical issue. Please confirm via WhatsApp that this is possible. Thank you. Okay, D Dr. Molina, I feel bad uh, interrupting you. Please go ahead with that question really fast and then we will continue. With, no, with just uh, it, it was just a technical question to Dr. Sarenson. Uh, okay. Does he consider the somaclonal selection, variant selection of the, Ch of the Taiwanese uh, breeders, so they call them, they don't breed, it's, uh, it's not the traditional crossing. Uh, does he consider yeah. that as a mutation breeding? Uh, actually, not. Uh, I, as you say correctly, we call it soma clonal variation, which means that uh, stable genetic change has not been introduced, but probably some type of epigenetic modification has been uh, achieved in these particular clones. Now, and uh, so uh, my question to you was: uh, in in the course of the years. Has there been attempts to try to identify what actually happens on the genomic level in these soma clones? No, none. Uh, maybe that you should be the work uh, that you should be doing. Uh, looking at uh, you step back with the R4 for Musana, you should look at look at that. that. But yeah. the, you see, this, uh, tissue culture is a mutation uh, is a mutagen also. In in some cases, you do achieve uh, stable genetic uh, differences in soma clones, but most cases these are epigenetic uh, modifications, which turn out uh, to have difficulties in stability. The reason I'm pushing this is that uh, we are pushing this as an approach, especially for uh, the big companies where they can they're using uh, tissue culture in mass and they are observing a lot of off type sometimes, and that off type is a cause of, is a, a mutation process, and but they have the ability to uh, collect or to select from millions of, 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 of population, and that is which is an element of any breeding program. You need population, right? That's correct. And what I would be extremely interesting to see if we can elucidate what have really happened in the Formosana genotype on a genomic level. Work on yes, it, that please. Is very important. Very, very important. And for the stability also. Absolutely. Good. So thank, thank you very much. We will have more opportunities to continue this uh, discussion because um, I, I am sure that we will. Um, touch base again and organize other webinars precisely on this topic. So now uh, I, I think it's respectful if we continue with the agenda and continue with the other panelists. So thank you very much for the panelists of the first two blocks and, and questions formulated. Again, we will have a chances to uh, address all those questions in the report with the panelists. Please um, um, be with us until the end of the, of the webinar because maybe we'll have time to formulate those questions before we finish. So um, now I would like to continue uh, with this last block on conventional bleeding and resistant varieties to TR4. For that, I would like to give the floor in the first place to Dr. Frederic Batri. He's a well-known banana breeder at CIDAD. Uh, he holds a PhD in plant breeding and has spent at least half of his life working with bananas. He currently works in the AGAP Institute, Genetic Improvement and Adaptation of Mediterranean and Tropical Plants. In the uh, GABA team, GABA team, uh, on banana genetics and breeding, uh, his main areas of work are focused on genetic resources, breeding strategies, biotechnologies, and field selection of Musasia. With experience in France, Guadeloupe, and, and Brazil, Frederic Batry uh, has carved his, uh, for himself as a unique career and um, thanks to his readiness for taking risks and spreading the roads less traveled in the field of breeding. So Dr. Bakri, please you have the floor presenting the vaina varieties developed by CIDAT with resistance on DR4. The screen is yours. 
Yeah, thank you very much for this, this introduction. Can you put my uh, presentation on the screen, please? Can you see it? It's already there. No, I don't see it. Well, anyway, I have my... <laughs> would would you like to share your screen? Would you, pre would you prefer uh, no, to share uh, your screen? I can share. I can, try, I can try to share my screen, yes. If you have it ready, uh, maybe it will be easier for you. So I'm going to stop my... No, but yes. I prefer that oh. you put on yourself, yourself my presentation oh. on the screen. I, I was not sharing. Is... I was not sharing the screen. You, you are right, but then is the perfect opportunity for you to share it. Please, Doctor Beckley. You I have can. the button available. What? Sorry. Yes. 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 Yes.
dryness tolerance, but also, if possible, tolerance to pests and disease. We will nematodes, black cigatoca too, and clearly uh, fusarios, uh, fusariosis. But food quality, and in particular, reg regarding the cooking ability of this. <coughs> Sorry. The food quality. Next slide, please. Next. Thank you very much. So, uh, genetic improvement in banana and even in syrup must be considered as in a holistic approach, including uh, a rank of various activities, scientific activities, and development activities. We have to consider upstream research in the area of genomic and genetics, but also has underlined and by Inter Sorensen. The main constraints in banana breeding is probably the difficulty to get seeds, good seeds, for selecting in good condition, good varieties. I will come back on this issue later. Uh, the second point, after upstream research, we have the proper activities of breeding and selection of progenies. But at that, at that uh, step, the work is not concluded, is not finished, and we have to develop in given some agro systems, uh, given agro systems, there's new varieties. And each new variety need and will need to develop its own, its proper agro system. And finally, uh, finally uh, probably in close partnership with uh, suppliers and uh, Mark markets, we have to make fine tuning uh, in terms of adaptation of for our variety. Here I put a slice of one of our uh, most advanced varieties on the European market. Point of the, its name is, it's a new hybrid. Next slide, please. Next, Victor, thank you very much. Banana genetic improvement program, upstream genetic research, upstream genomics and genetic research. Uh, clearly, to perform better our activities of breeding, uh, we need to acquire many knowledge on various aspects of the banana complex. First of all, species complex, uh, knowledge of the species complex, uh, the diversity of this complex, the organization and the domestication process, because we will use this knowledge to optimize our own breeding strategy and clearly the choice of the parents to make breeding. And second aspect, very important in banana because banana is vegetatively, vegetatively propagated and is carrying a lot of uh, structural, we would say, aberration. Most of the cultivated varieties are bearing structural variation in the genome, mosaic genome structure, and we know that all these accidents have an impact on recombination and chromosome distribution in the gametes of banana. So we are to take into account this knowledge to perform better the choice of our parents and the selection. The third point, very important, is the genetic basis and tr transmission of traits. There, it's extremely easy to make a genetic uh, segregating population with wilds, but when we want to work with cultivated varieties, as said by Anker, if I remember well, it's extremely difficult. And the production of segregating population is a difficult task, not in wilds, but in cultivated varieties. I will come back later on this issue. Next slide. Please. So <coughs> in breeding, uh, we defended since the beginning an approach relying on deep weights clothes, cultivated deep weights clothes, stipulating that they are the origins of the triplet varieties. And we need a better knowledge about the situation of these diploid clothes. And what, what can we say? There is no, absolutely no diploid clothes today in a cultivated clothes, no wild, huh? cultivated clothes which are not an hybrid, uh, hybrid of various sources of different wild types. On the left, we, you can see green means uh, in this slide for the clone Guyo. Green means uh, Musa cumulata banksy origin. Uh, violet or red 
means uh, Musa Cumulata Zebrina origin, and we can see that in the Guyot clone originated from, I remember, Philippines, the composition of in this clone is a, more of 50% of the genome composition is coming from Musa Cumulata Bonsi. At the opposite, in the clone Manang, and Manang is important, but I will come later about this clone. Manang is a, a resistant clone to TRE4, RASA1 and TRE4. So Manang is interesting from a breeding point of view. And this is clone Manang, we can see that the formula, gen genomic formula of this clone is much more equilibrated. We can find Banksy origin, but also Zebrina and Malacansis origin too. So the, mo the mosaic observer suggests that present-day cultivars originate from two up to five wild ancestors involving in such case several generations of meiotic combination. Next slide, please. I would like to share with you a very nice example about the studies of domestication and how we can use these elements to carry out, to, to perform better, uh, sorry, to perform better our activities in banana breeding. Here is an example of the origin of Cavendish and Gros Michel variety as Pome Prata varieties. What is amazing is that in both cases, if we make hypothesis about the formation of twin gametes at the origin of the triplet varieties, both groups, <coughs> sorry, one, Fouillet, the second, AAB, share the same Charé origin in their genomes. In one case, it is an accumulata balacarasis uh, which led to the formation of, uh, in, in cross, sorry, in cross with the uh, Charé gametes, which led to Cavendish and Gros Michel and clones of the same composition, more or less the same composition in 3A. And if we replace a Chi genome by the Balbizana genome, the same Charé with two N gametes led to Pome Prata uh, natural uh, varieties. So this knowledge, we will use it to recreate, starting from Charé, or starting from other crops, including resistance to disease, virus disease, we will include this knowledge, we will use this knowledge to recreate new varieties from deep region plus. Next slide, please. The third point that I talk about is clearly the search of new genes involved in phenotypic traits. And recently, we published a, a paper on the detection of QTRs for food quality related to traits in a diploid population where we cross cultivated varieties. In that case, it was Pizan Madu by the clone Galeo. <coughs> Sorry, which, is, which are sufficient uh, distant enough to uh, reveal uh, polymorphisms, no? a identification of QTL, and so on. 26 major QTL have been identified in this genome, and clearly, we will use this knowledge to make the search of genes involved in the quality of the fruits. Next slide. Next slide, please. <coughs> no, the challenge is how to use all this knowledge to perform good breeding. And uh, so I will go back in, uh, in the next slides on this issue. But I just would like to emphasize that uh, recently we published the, the book of Gerd Kema and uh, I forget the second name, you will. And uh, uh, a chapter on uh, banana breeding, its name is Making Banana Breeding More Effective. Because uh, the, the difficulty in banana breeding to breed is easy, uh, to get seeds is easy, to get good seeds and good variety coming from good cross is much more difficult. So in this chapter, all people will find uh, answer, answer to, to the questions that they, they can have. Next, next uh, slide, please. Clearly, to perform a variety, to obtain varieties resistant to disease, it's better to start with gem plus, which is resistant to this disease. And uh, one of the most important clones for us has been to use uh, this accession IDN110, which is a diploid coming from Indonesia. And this clone uh, are 
uh, have a, a very interesting features. Is resistant to yellow cigatobac, yellow cigatoca, black lipstick disease, nematodes. And we found more recently that it's resistant to rsa one and TR4 in controlled conditions. So it shows that we use uh, these uh, clones to uh, perform uh, improvement in bananas. Next slide, please. The principle of overwashing <coughs> over in banana breeding is as is, is reconstructive breeding because we, we 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 try to mimic we try to mimic what made the nature in the past, trying to incorporate knowledge sources of resistance and trying to to come back to new varieties obtained by cross but very close to the present and current varieties but in the same time different because we want to include resistance to disease. So the first step is a step to selection of diploid germplasm within our, our varieties or even in wild types. We can <coughs> sorry, choose in AB clones or even in wild uh, BB clones uh, to perform crosses. And a very important step in our strategy as is to, as we don't manage, we don't know how to master the production of two-head gametes in banana, we decide to enter a process of systematically making chromosome doubling to get a copy, a tetraploid copy of each diploid clone. And we use this tetraploid copy in back crows with deep, all the diploid clones to obtain three triploid accumulator or uh, AAB if we cross an AABB by an AA, or even we can obtain by this strategy, AAB is crossing uh, tetraploid A with Balbiziana, and even ABBs we got uh, more recently, crossing AABB by BB accession. And in fact, today, I think that we have been able to cover all the the range of this genomic new genetic structure is important for us because using this approach, we think that we can reach every system of uh, production for uh, ag uh, intensive agro systems, but also for local system where uh, consideration such as access to water, rusticity are more important. I, when I'm telling about that, I'm thinking in terms of, uh, in, I'm thinking in new hybrids, ABB hybrids. But in fact, in this approach, the, the main challenge for us is to identify the right uh, combination, uh, the, the right combination between two parents. In other terms, the right uh, specific company ability between two parents. Next. Thanks to the support of Arlingen about uh, resistance to TFA, therefore, we, 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 we were in the process of selecting varieties, namely in Guadeloupe, against uh, yellow cigatoca first and black leaf streak disease in second. And uh, thanks to Yetrema, we had the opportunity to screen in our in controlled condition in Arlingen our elite hybrids, but also deep age gem plus. Uh, against uh, RSA, RSA1 and TFO in controlled conditions. And clearly, we have been satisfied to identify some varieties, really, some of them resistant or completely immune in the case of this selection X17, completely immune to um, TRE4 in controlled conditions. But we also select a new hybrids uh, in this controlled condition. I, we will see that no, they are being, evalu being evaluated in Australia in northern territories against the 4 in field conditions. So we have been able to first identify new hybrids, desert hybrids, and uh, of 3A constitution and tomorrow of AAB constitution. And we already have two but I hope in the future much more, using parents resistant to TR4. The selection process now for us is to select the best variety, considering black lipstick disease resistance, yellow cigatoca is less important today, but also productivity, quite fruit quality, and so on. When we make a cross between a wild 
Balbizana accessions pollinated by a clone such IDN 110 tetraploids. In one cross, we can produce more than 100, 120 seeds in one pollination. We already have too much material for the place we are in the field to make efficient selection. That means that <clears throat> we are really have to search to work about the best way to get large progenies, which can lead to interesting segregating varieties in the, in the segregating population and for selection and interesting varieties in this segregating population. So next slide, please. Yes, that's exactly. I see that you still have four slides. I, mindful of the time, I would appreciate if we can allow some time for the last panelist also. So, okay. just for and your information. Just to say, so, so, so that uh, our varieties is, are currently in Australia, and uh, we confirm in, uh, with the trials made in Australia the comportment in notifying controlled conditions, at least about three hybrids. They are here, 924. 931 and 938. I just would like to remember to, that we they, they performed in first uh, crop and the first ratoon two without any samples. I just would like to emphasize also that these are not only resistant to TRE4 and RASA1, but also to black leaf strain disease. Next. We have developed a system and a partnership to evaluate our varieties, not only in fresh windies, but also with couple and, uh, of partners uh, according to their interest in our own interest too. And uh, namely, uh, all the hybrids as much as possible, we send our hybrids in uh, we send in Australia to verify the comportment of our hybrids regarding TRE4, but also the comportment of the consumers regarding these new varieties. Uh, in particular, if we develop these varieties, uh, in uh, organic systems. Uh, black leaf streak disease is not present in Australia, but yellow cicatoca is still present. If tomorrow we can stop with any treatment, it will, from our point of view, very nice. Next slide. So just, uh, I would like to remember here that uh, on this side, CIRAD uh, launched an initiative, World Music Alliance, where the objective is to join research banana producers on the platform to take a tear cat fusarium on the other main disease. Clearly, starting from our current activities, testing new banana varieties, hybrids implementing at the international testing network. But we would like to reinforce our breeding capacities to produce much more hybrids in the future regarding different objectives. And these activities, of, these activities of breeding supported by upstream research for direct application after in breeding. For any contact, please contact Denis Leyer, Jean Carlier, and Sierra. Next slide. I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Bakri. Highly appreciated, very uh, insightful information. Ahora mm, vamos a pasar al español. Um, Aviso con calma para la interpretación que puedan cambiar de, de canal y para todos aquellos eh, que estaban escuchando el, el canal en off y quieran seguir escuchando la interpretación simultánea en inglés, tienen que irse al canal en inglés. Please, those who need uh, English, now you need to switch in case you're in the off channel, you need to go through the, to the uh, English channel. Así que sin más eh, dilación y con el ánimo de dar la, la palabra a nuestro último, pero... Importante invitado del doctor Adolfo Martínez, que como saben es el director de la Fundación de Investigación Agraria de, de Honduras y tiene una intensa, eh, extensiva diría yo mejor, experiencia en coordinar programas de, de investigación enfocados en el desarrollo y la mejora de variedades de bananas y plátanos. La Fundación Hondureña de Investigación Agrícola tiene eh, el, un programa de, de mejora genética de de la musacia y tienen más de 50 años de experiencia y han desarrollado eh, varias variedades eh, con características y resistencia a la, a la enfermedad. El doctor Adolfo eh, Martínez presentará el, eh, los híbridos de banana y las variedades de, desarrolladas por FIA con resistencia al R4T y otras enfermedades. Doctor, tiene usted la palabra. Y nuestro micrófono encendido, doctor Martín. 
Sí, muy bien, muchas gracias. Eh, yo creo Bienvenido. que ya puede comenzar la presentación, Víctor, y buenos días a todos. Eh, un saludo cordial desde la Lima, Honduras, donde está nuestra oficina desde hace muchos años. Eh, les voy a presentar, eh, la presentación está bien en dos partes. Primero, lo que hemos hecho hasta ahora y segundo, lo que estamos haciendo para el futuro. Siguiente. Bueno, eh, FIA es una, es una eh, organización sin ánimo de lucro privada. Eh, nosotros dependemos de nuestros propios fondos para nuestro financiamiento. Y para financiar el, el, el programa de Bonaro por muchos años eh, tuvo apoyo internacional, pero eso ya eh, cesó hace mucho tiempo. Y de ahí para acá hemos trabajado con fondos de empresas privadas. Ahora para desarrollar específicamente variedades Cavendish resistentes a TR4, eh, se conformó lo que llamamos nosotros una Musa Breeding Company, que está conformada por Agroamérica de Guatemala, por Dole PSC, la empresa internacional, y por McKay's Banana Marketing de Australia. Eh, esta empresa o esta sociedad comercial está compuesta, es, opera dentro de FIA. Obviamente FIA es miembro y está compuesta por una junta directiva y un comité técnico. Eh, todos los socios están representados en la junta directiva y en el comité técnico. Y obviamente como son socios comerciales con mucha experiencia en, en el negocio del banano pues, y en la investigación, cada uno aporta un amplio rango de habilidades, experiencia y conocimientos. Siguiente. Quiero mencionar que cuando se comenzó este consorcio o esta empresa comercial, se invitaron a todas las compañías grandes y algunas medianas para participar y solo estas tres compañías eh, mostraron interés en participar. Eh, un, un breve, una breve historia del mejoramiento genético de la FIA. Eh, el mejoramiento genético aquí comenzó en el año 1959, o sea, hace unos 60 años. Eh, para desarrollar híbridos eh, de Gros Michel resistentes a raza 1, que fue la, la raza de Fusarium que acabó con el Gros Michel en esa época. El programa comenzó, bueno, primero con una colección que se hizo en el sureste de Asia, donde se trajeron eh, cerca de mil variedades de diferentes tipos de bananos para su estudio genético. Y... Y, y con ellos desarrollar diploides para ser utilizados luego en el mejoramiento genético de bananos tipo Gros Michel en esa época. Afortunadamente, cuando se estaba en ese proceso, se descubrió el Cavendish que era eh, resistente a la raza 1, pero era muy susceptible a la siga toca y el programa cambió un poco de énfasis y se vio o cambió su objetivo de trabajar con resistencia a Fusarium para trabajar con resistencia con diploides resistentes a cigatoca negra. Eh, el énfasis pues fue en desarrollo de híbridos con resistencia a cigatoca negra en Cavendish por, por, hasta el año 1984, eh, cuando Chiquita, que fue la que inició este programa en los años 50, eh, decidió dar por terminada la investigación en Banana y transfirió el programa a FIA con ciertos fondos del sector privado hondureño, del gobierno de Honduras, de Chiquita y del gobierno de Estados Unidos. Y así se creó la FIA como una empresa privada. Eh, sin embargo, como la naturaleza de la empresa había, de FIA había cambiado, o del programa de mejoramiento genético, eh, los donantes internacionales eh, exigieron que se hiciera mejoramiento pero en musasias para mercado local y no para exportación. Ellos decían que la exportación la deberían pagar las empresas comerciales y no la cooperación internacional. Entonces, así se trabajó por muchos años, hasta el 2003, donde retomamos un nuevo programa de mejoramiento genético con Chiquita, pero ese era para producir bananos especiales. Chiquita estaba muy preocupada de que solo había un clon de banano en el mercado y que en cualquier momento podía haber una catástrofe. 
Ese programa funcionó por 10 años y ellos querían un banano que fuera totalmente diferente al Cavendish. Y en ese, en ese periodo se desarrollaron eh, unos ocho híbridos de bananos, de los cuales Chiquitas tiene patentados dos. Ustedes pueden ver las patentes, están publicadas en internet. Uno se llama Chiquita Banana CQB eh, 114 y el otro creo que 115 o 116. Si ustedes entran ahí pueden ver la genealogía, las propiedades y todo lo demás. Estos son bananos eh, pequeños, no son grandes como el Cavendish, son muy productivos, son resistentes a cigatoca, resistentes a raza 1 de Fusarium, no los hemos evaluado para raza 4, en esa época no teníamos eh, cómo hacerlo, de muy buen sabor y las pocas pruebas que hizo Chiquita en esa época tenían muy buena aceptabilidad en el mercado, especialmente en Europa. Sin embargo, después la compañía sufrió cambios y la han vendido dos veces, creo, y, y eso está en, en el olvido o en almacenamiento. Luego, a partir del 2016, ya comenzamos eh, con este consorcio que tiene cinco años y son los resultados que les voy a mostrar un poco más adelante con estas tres empresas de Agroamérica de Guatemala, Mackays de Honduras y Dole Internacional. Siguiente. Bueno, nuestra estrategia de desarrollo no ha cambiado a través de los años. Obviamente eh, tenemos eh, otras tecnologías para hacer lo mismo, pero en general eh, lo primero que hizo el programa fue el desarrollo de diploides mejorados para luego cruzarlos con madres tetraploides. El, el desarrollo de, ma de madres tetraploides de Cavendish no fue fácil, pero lo logramos hacer en los últimos años y es lo que estamos utilizando ahora. Eh, al cruzar los diploides mejorados con las madres tetraploides tipo Cavendish, obtenemos triploides que luego van a evaluación agronómica. Luego van a, primero van a evaluación agronómica aquí en nuestras fincas en, en Honduras. Y una vez pasan unos dos o tres ciclos de producción, ya van para evaluación eh, con nuestros socios y eh, evaluación para resistencia a TR4. Eh, luego pruebas de comercialización y finalmente se van a patentar los híbridos que son propiedad de la empresa de mercado. Siguiente. Bueno, como base para el programa, pues, eh, hay muchos estudios sobre eh, materiales que son resistentes a, a, a raza 4, a raza 1, siga toca. Y aquí he escogido este como un ejemplo para mostrarles a ustedes eh, parte del fundamento de lo que nosotros hacemos. Y ustedes pueden ver allí, ahí hay materiales de, de varias partes, están los GCTVs, hay dos o tres de ellos. Y ustedes pueden ver eh, eh, los materiales tetraploides principalmente de FIA, con excepción del FIA 25, eh, que son resistentes a, a raza 4 y también algunos diploides que ustedes pueden ver en ese gráfico, que han sido eh, comprobados de resistencia a raza 1 y a raza 4 de Fusario. Es, este estudio fue hecho en Australia. Eh, hay varios estudios de estos que ustedes pueden encontrar. Solo escogí este para mostrarles eh, como el fundamento, la base de lo que estamos haciendo. Siguiente. Bueno, entonces, eh, lo que hemos desarrollado hasta ahora y sus diferentes resistencias, aquí les he puesto 10, hay otros por allí, pero les voy a poner los 10 más importantes que son el, hay bananos de postre, hay bananos de cocción, hay bananos de postre tipo Gros Michel, y hay bananos de postre tipo Pratana, dos plátanos, otro banano de postre, postre tipo Gros Michel, banano de cocción el FIA 25 y un banano de postre el FIA 26. Ahora, eh, la mayoría de estos materiales son resistentes a, a cigatoca, son entre resistentes, tolerantes y moderadamente resistentes. Eh, son resistentes a raza 1, con excepción del FIA 26, que prácticamente ya lo hemos eliminado, a pesar de que es un, es un banano con excelente sabor, excelente racimo, 
y excelentes propiedades de post cosecha, pero no se puede sembrar en sitios donde ha habido raza 1, porque es susceptible. Y tenemos en raza 4, lo que sabemos nosotros hasta ahora es que el día 1, 2 y 3 son resistentes, el 17 es susceptible, el 18 es resistente, y algo muy interesante son los dos plátanos que tenemos, el 20 y 21. Se habla mucho de que la raza 4 es un, puede ser un problema de seguridad alimentaria. Eh, genéticamente es, es posible que tanto el FIA 20 como el FIA 21 sean resistentes a raza 4. Y hemos visto varios estudios realizados en diferentes partes del, del mundo que así lo dicen que tanto el 20 como el 21 son resistentes a raza 4. En mi opinión, necesitamos hacer una investigación un poco más detallada y más científica para llegar a esa conclusión. Pero eh, yo pensando en América Latina y sobre todo en Colombia, que es un gran consumidor de plátano, si ya tienen FIA 20 y 21, creo que lo mejor que pudieran hacer ellos inmediatamente es llevar estos dos materiales a los sitios infectados y observarlos. Estos materiales ya están en Colombia hace muchos años. Eh, bueno, tenemos el FIA 23, eh, que es resistente a raza 1 y, a raza, eh, y no sabemos si es resistente a raza 4 o no. No se ha evaluado todavía. El FIA 25 sí es prácticamente inmune a cigatoca, raza 1 y raza 4. Eh, lo, men lo mencionó el doctor Molina. Es un banano de cocción que no tiene buen sabor, pero le puede producir más de 80 toneladas por hectárea y es una gran fuente de carbohidratos. Eh, sabemos que en varios países de África lo están utilizando para proceso o para cocción, no para fruta fresca. Bueno, eso es lo que hemos desarrollado hasta ahora. El siguiente. Ahora, todos estos materiales están disponibles en bancos de germoplasma, en, en, en muchos sitios los pueden conseguir. Bueno, entonces para el futuro, el programa comenzó eh, con el desarrollo de madres Cavendish, eh, tetraploides. Esto, o sea que esta planta que ustedes ven ahí es un Cavendish 100% tetraploide, el cual costó bastante trabajo eh, hacerla, pero ya hemos, ya hemos desarrollado varias, como ustedes pueden ver aquí. Aquí tienen fotos de, de cinco y el anterior son seis. O sea que tenemos varias madres tetraploides. Algunas de estas madres son, son 100% Cavendish. Tenemos otras que son 50% Cavendish y 50% Gros Michel. Eh, nos gusta mucho el sabor de Gros Michel. Hay eh, mucha gente que dice que el Gros Michel tiene mejor sabor que el Cavendish. Ya la gente se acostumbró al Cavendish. Y probablemente piensen que el Cavendish es mejor, pero todo esto es asunto de, de gustos, de mercadeo y de acostumbrar a la gente. El siguiente. Bueno, ustedes aquí pueden ver un racimo típico de una madre eh, tetraploide Cavendish. El, el, los bananos son Cavendish, saben a Cavendish, la planta es Cavendish, tiene las mismas eh, susceptibilidades obviamente a cigatoque y demás eh, el mismo porte o sea que es 100% caben siguiente aquí tenemos un híbrido triploide de una planta ya seleccionada eh, como ustedes pueden ver esto es en nuestra finca, la planta es libre de cigatoca, no usamos control de cigatoca, la planta no es muy alta. El racimo que se aprecia ahí, obviamente, eh, no es exactamente el potencial de esa planta, porque como solo tenemos una al inicio, no se hace de cige. Entonces, ustedes pueden ver que ahí hay cerca de 10 plantas, las cuales luego se sacan los cormos, se, se siembran individualmente, y se hace un segundo, una segunda prueba en nuestras instalaciones antes de enviarlas a, a nuestros socios. Ellos vienen, miran, escogen y hacen sus ensayos en sus propias fincas. Adelante. Eh, hasta ahora lo que hemos notado es que la gran mayoría, no quiero decir el 80 o 90 por ciento, 
pero sí la gran mayoría de los híbridos que hemos producido utilizando estas estrategias son resistentes a cigatoca negra, lo cual vendría a reducir mucho los costos de producción. Ustedes vieron que en Costa Rica creo que mencionaron que el 32% del costo de producción es control de cigatoca. Es más de 1.500, 2.000 dólares al año por hectárea. Obviamente también va a facilitar estos nuevos híbridos la producción de bananos orgánicos, no transgénicos. Adelante. Bueno, hasta ahora, en, en estos cinco o seis años que llevamos trabajando, se han desarrollado 38 híbridos con la estrategia antes mencionada. Algunos híbridos son eh, con las madres eh, Cavendish, otros con las madres que están cruzadas con Gros Michel. De los 38 que se han enviado para evaluación, eh, se han evaluado hasta ahora preliminarmente 16. Y de esos 16, 6 han salido altamente resistentes, 2 resistentes, 2 resist susceptibles, 3 altamente susceptibles y 3 que faltan por confirmar. Obviamente, estos trabajos se han hecho en Sudáfrica y tenemos... Eh, problemas con el envío de plantas eh, viables porque una vez lleguen las plantas a Sudáfrica pues hay que reproducirlas en laboratorio luego ir al campo y es un proceso que demora eh, prácticamente un año eh, estamos ahora ya por recibir próximamente en los próximos meses la evaluación de otros híbridos que se han enviado anteriormente adicionalmente a Sudáfrica también se han enviado los híbridos a Australia donde ya han salido de cuarentena ya hay varios eh, híbridos que están siendo sembrados en fincas comerciales y creo que eh, en, estos, en este primer trimestre del año ya se van a sembrar en suelos contaminados en los territorios del norte de Australia para hacer el, el, la resistencia a raza 4 final en el campo. Esa va a ser la prueba de fuego para nuestros híbridos. Ustedes aquí pueden ver fotos de tres híbridos mejorados tipo Cavendish. Eh, estos racimos, pues hemos notado nosotros que después del segundo ciclo, o sea que salen de nuestra estación y caen en manos de las empresas comerciales, pues mejora el tamaño del dedo, mejora el tamaño del racimo, obviamente por el manejo que ellos le dan por sus prácticas de riego, fertilización, etcétera, eh, que ellos tienen en sus fincas. Adelante. Aquí podemos ver el, el tipo de, de dedo que se produce. No son exactamente iguales al Cavendish, son muy parecidos. Eh, obviamente, antes de nosotros eh, seleccionar algo, lo probamos para asegurarnos de que tenga buen sabor, porque sabemos que el sabor ha sido un, es una característica supremamente importante para el consumidor. Y lo mismo también, pues, en las, en las características post cosechas. Entonces, aquí pueden ver algunos de los híbridos. Tienen muy bonito color. Son algo diferentes, en, a veces en su forma, en su curvatura. Pero es importante que todos sean empacables. Aquí tenemos una finca de un ensayo que se hizo en una finca de doble aquí en Honduras. Y algo similar se ha hecho en fincas en Guatemala y, y, a, y está en proceso en Australia. Bueno, eh, dentro de las posibilidades de desarrollo de musácea que tenemos en FIA, pues aquí tenemos ya madres de varios tipos de traploides para desarrollar triploides de una gran variedad de, de diferentes eh, musáceas. Por ejemplo, el Cavendish nuevo, que es en lo que estamos más tra trabajando más ahora. Eh, también podemos trabajar en, en, en revivir un Gros Michel, eh, que tenga márgenes de Gros Michel menos de Cavendish, en bananos tipo dátil, tipo manzano, ladyfinger, algo que nadie está haciendo o que se oye muy poco es trabajar en plátano mejorado. Como les mencioné, ya hemos producido dos. De esos dos, es muy posible que uno de ellos tenga resistencia a, a raza 4. Los dos tienen diploides con resistencia a raza 4, o sea que es posible que los dos sean resistentes, pero eso hay que confirmarlo en el campo. Y son, son, son plátanos que ya están en producción en gran escala comercial 
en varias partes, incluyendo en Honduras y qué sé yo, en República Dominicana, y más que hay otros países también. Eh, también desarrollaron paranos de cocción tipo FIA 25 y tenemos uno que hemos desarrollado últimamente que tiene un alto contenido de betacaroteno, que en este momento estamos haciendo pruebas con una de las empresas del consorcio para ver qué potencial de mercadeo puede tener. Siguiente. Bueno, eh, esto concluye mi presentación. Obviamente aquí en FIA están muy agradecidos a McKay's Banana Marketing de Australia, a Agroamérica de Guatemala y a DOL por el financiamiento del programa. Este no es un trabajo de una persona, eh, ni de una empresa, sino de un equipo. Y tenemos un comité técnico que está conformado por el doctor Juan Fernando Aguilar de FIA, el doctor Víctor González de FIA, el doctor Marlos López de FIA, el doctor Roberto Young de DOL y el doctor Patricio Gutiérrez de DOL. Tenemos el doctor Bob Williams de McKay's, a Cameron McKay de McKay's, a Franz Willemaker de representando Agroamérica y al ingeniero Luis Falcon de Agroamérica. Eh, muchas gracias a todos. Muchas gracias, don Adolfo. Como siempre, una presentación muy interesante. Eh, hemos llegado al, al, al final del webinario. Eh, Teníamos previsto que quizás hubiera una pequeña sesión de preguntas y respuestas. Le voy a dar la palabra a nuestra experta trabajando en, en la oficina en Panamá, Esther Peralta, para que formule alguna pregunta. Y como dije antes, las preguntas se eh, eh, administrarán. Intentaremos responderlas por correo electrónico con cada una de las personas que las formularon. Eh, y luego tenemos las conclusiones por parte de la oficial de Agricultura en, en la oficina en Panamá, Raíz Ayauca. Entonces, eh, sin más dilación, quería pedir antes de darles la palabra a Esther y a Raísa si eh, podemos contar con interpretación durante quizás eh, 10, 15 minutitos. Imagina que no habrá problema, por favor, si tienen algún problema me informan a través del chat. Y eh, le doy la palabra a Esther Peralta. Esther, creo que tienes el, el micrófono funcionando. Adelante. Gracias, Víctor. Eh, bueno... La, 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 las opiniones que hay son muy favorables sobre estas presentaciones y eh, creo que eh, dentro de, de algunas de las cosas que o no se habían respondido o están eh, solicitando ahora, es, eh, está lo, el comportamiento o los resultados, los, los últimos resultados que se tienen de la evaluación o el comportamiento de los híbridos, tanto del CIRAT como del FIA, aunque el doctor Adolfo acaba de hablar sobre eso, y de, de los programas de Wageningen y otros que se han hablado aquí, incluyendo los de cultivo de tejidos, etc., sobre su evaluación en países donde existe la enfermedad. Sería muy útil que en ese sentido nos dijeran cuánto tiempo... Eh, se calcula para concluir las evaluaciones de comportamiento y poder eh, disponer eh, en cuánto tiempo se podría disponer de diferentes híbridos, diferentes clones. Y también, por favor, si estos eh, híbridos clones se han evaluado para otras enfermedades en particular, para el bonchito. Eh, muchas gracias. Adelante, doctor Frederick y doctor Adolfo. Y, y si alguno de los otros ponentes quiere eh, abundar, muchas gracias. Maybe can I start to at least to other uh, to for Sirad. Uh, our varieties are currently evaluated uh, in various systems in partnership with, with uh, different partners around the world. The most advanced partnership concerning field evaluation is clearly with Australia. And uh, is not concerning only uh, RSA1 and TRE4. It's addressing also the question, as I said, of yellow cigatoka. And uh, clearly, when we propose new varieties, we want to go out from the Cavendish system. Clearly, we, we are thinking about new production systems, uh, mainly based on uh, natural uh, resistance of the, the hybrids. 
it's difficult to 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 to, to select hybrids for uh, exportation because the constraints around post harvest qualities are very important and very hard. But at the same time, there is so much opportunities, and I think that Adolfo Martinez with be in accord with me, there are so much opportunities for local markets where the constraints of uh, exportation, uh, uh, post harvest, sorry, as post harvest uh, conditions are less uh, uh, difficult. And I really think that in the future, regarding uh, these new varieties, we will assist uh, to the diffusion of these new varieties, really, in worldwide, maybe not immediately, but in the future, much and much and more varieties will be developed. Yes, I, I think it's very, very important uh, what Frederick just said. Uh, you have to remember that only 10% of, uh, of the banana market is for export. The only 80% is for domestic consumption. And, and that we cannot forget that. Um, the evaluation of tier four in Australia, uh, if you include the quarantine that they have, uh, it's a long process. Uh, it can take three to four years. And then when you do the evaluation, uh, you have to do at least two or three cycles, especially if you're going to go to a intentionally contaminated field. Uh, we have noticed that intentional contaminated field, sometimes they have very high levels of fusarium that are not sustainable in the soil. And we have noticed some of our previous hybrids that they are much better in the second cycle than in the first one. And that is probably because the population of the Fusarium has decreased naturally because the soil cannot sustain such high levels of inoculum. So, so you have to be careful with that. But it takes at least two cycles in the field, plus whatever restrictions you have in the country for quarantine and multiplication. So you're talking about three to four years. There the were other questions. I, I think we, we have many. Uh, on, on I, have, I see a question here about bricks and, and mm -hmm. some of our new hybrids have a higher bricks than, than Cavendish. And this is 22, 23, we have gone up to 26. But um, also you have, to, you have to know that actually what uh, the flavor buds, what they, what they favor is the ratio of bricks and acidity. So you have to have the right proportion of both. So you have to look at both bricks and acidity. Thank you very much. Again, there are many questions that are supposed to be addressed, but we will do it yes. um, after the webinar. Thank uh, you very much. Uh, Victor, mm -hmm. Victor, por favor, que vean en, en el chat la referencia de los resultados que se han tenido de manejo y otras experiencias en Mozambique, porque había muchas preguntas sobre eso y ahí pueden tener información. Gracias. Ok, yo, yo voy a copiarlo de nuevo aquí para que lo puedan ver todos. Aquí está este, es el enlace al que se refiere Esther. Eh, muy bien. Mira, pues... Víctor, eh, otra pregunta que yo veo es sobre el ciclo de producción de, de los híbridos. Eh, tenemos un par de los nuevos híbridos que son muy precoces y producen uno y hasta dos meses antes que el Cavendish. Los otros son similares. Obviamente, si usted puede producir en, en uno o dos meses menos, eh, su rentabilidad va a aumentar, eh, su control de enfermedades va a disminuir su costo y la producción va a ser mucho más rápida. O sea que tenemos esa ventaja adicional con un par de híbridos también. Es muy interesante. La verdad que es muy interesante. Seguiremos esta discusión. Además, eh, sí, estoy un poco pendiente del tiempo porque tenemos, además de los participantes y panelistas, tenemos al, al, el servicio de interpretación simultánea que, que bueno, están, 
ya en el límite de su tiempo de trabajo con nosotros. Entonces, quería darle la palabra para cerrar a la oficial de Agricultura, a Raisa Jauber, y con ello nos despedimos hasta mañana. Como les dije, tenemos un, unos panelistas muy interesantes y una sesión muy interesante mañana. Por favor, continúen con nosotros porque haremos un resumen de todo lo que hemos discutido en los dos días. Adelante, Raisa. Gracias. Muchas gracias, Víctor. Y bueno, he hecho un pequeño resumen del día de, de hoy. Eh, gracias ante todo a los panelistas por las excelentes presentaciones y también a todos los participantes. Realmente hay muchas preguntas que responder aún en el chat que estaremos enviando por los correos electrónicos y las diferentes maneras que tenemos. Es un tema muy adecuado a la actualidad, no solo para la región de América Latina y Caribe, sino también eh, a nivel global. Ha sido una sesión de, de gran valor por los resultados científicos y que hoy se han presentado en general y de, de gran importancia para el sector bananero. Se abordaron temas de gran relevancia como son los relacionados con las mejoras de tecnología para abordar la resistencia a las diferentes enfermedades y con énfasis en la raza 4 tropical. Se hizo alusión a diferentes reportes de materiales promisorios haciendo hincapié del uso en diferentes países como es el caso del Formosana con las diferentes evaluaciones, adaptaciones Uh, con sus características agronómicas y la adecuación también por diferentes compañías. Se enfatiza en la necesidad de hacerlo siempre a través de un programa de manejo de la enfermedad y de gran importancia y valor su evaluación en campo. Se enmarca todo lo relacionado en cuanto al comportamiento agronómico de Formosana y otras variedades promisorias para el caso de resistencia a la raza 4 tropical. Por otra parte, vale señalar que lo relacionado con las variedades tienen varios aspecto, aspectos a destacar y de esta manera poder mejorar las alternativas de manejo para lograr una mayor resiliencia en el cultivo. Se señalan los diferentes resultados de programas de mejoramiento, como es el caso de Bageninge, Sirat, F Filipinas, Sudáfrica, El FIA, con nuevos eh, eh, materiales promisorios, buscando siempre los temas vinculados a la calidad de la fruta y eh, su aplicación en distintos países, enfocando así el desempeño agronómico de las diferentes variedades promisorias. Así como se recalca la necesidad siempre de la vinculación de los diferentes programas de mejoramiento genético y el sector académico y científico para saber qué podemos llevar hoy a la mesa, al campo de nuestros eh, productores. Para finalizar, a partir de los diferentes programas de mejoramiento genético presentados en el día de hoy y que existen a nivel de los diferentes países y a nivel global, sus instituciones científicas, se evidencian las alternativas para acceder de manera biosegura a nuevas variedades alternativas producto del mejoramiento genético para poder enfrentar la raza 4 tropical. De esta manera eh, concluimos nuestra sesión de webinario y mañana nos estaremos encontrando nuevamente y agradecemos muchísimo a todos los expertos internacionales por sus conferencias y a los colegas participantes por las preguntas emitidas en el chat, así como a nuestros colegas del Foro Mundial de Banano y la doctora Esther Lilia Peralta por eh, todo eh, lo relacionado con la logística del, del taller. Gracias, Víctor. Muchas gracias. Que pasen ustedes buen día. Nos vemos mañana y gracias especialmente a los panelistas y al servicio de interpretación.